So good evening. Welcome to the closing round table. First I would like to introduce our panel which consists of five very distinguished mathematicians. On my far right, uh, Leonard Carlison, Professor Emeritus at the University of Uppsala and a former president of IMU. His research interests are in harmonic analysis and dynamical systems. Now all of our panelists are recipients of many awards and I decided that it would take far too much time to list them all, but I make an exception in reminding you that uh, Leonard Carlson was awarded this year's Arbel Prize, for which we offer many congratulations. <clears throat> I would like to say how much IMU values its collaboration on several fronts with the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters and the Arbel Fund. So, next. Uh, Ronald Koifman, who is Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science at Yale University, and his research interests are in analysis, in particular harmonic analysis and wavelets, and applications to information processing. On my immediate uh, right, uh, Yuri Manning, who is Professor of Mathematics at Northwestern University, a former director of the Max Planck Institute of Mathematics in, in Bonn, and a former chair of the Fields Medal and Program Committees of the ICM. And his research interests lie in algebraic geometry, in number theory, differential equations, and mathematical physics. On my immediate left, Helmut Neunzert, Professor Emeritus at the University of Kaiserslautern. He's a founding member and former president of the European Consortium for Mathematics in Industry and his research interests are in kinetic theory and fluid dynamics. And finally, on the far left, Peter Sarnak, a professor of mathematics at Princeton University, and his research interests are in number theory and analysis. Just in case I betray at some point my own views on the subject of the round table, I work in nonlinear analysis, especially the calculus of variations and its applications uh, to material science. By way of introduction, perhaps I can show the two earliest instances I know of in which the terms pure and applied mathematics feature in the literature. Oh, these were the, the panel, I forgot to do this, that's bad. Here's the, here's the first one, the, the first issue of the uh, journal, journal für uh, die Reine und Angewandte Mathematik, Kreller's Journal, which appeared in 1826 and the contents of the first issue is shown, and actually you can see several uh, papers there by Arbel. And ten years later, the first volume of the Journal de Mathématiques Pure et Appliquée, Liouville's journal, appeared, and here you see the papers are much more applied. Uh, the authors include Coriolis, Liouville, Ampère, Lame, Jacobi, and Sturm. So these were not bad for uh, first issues of these journals. The, the old volumes of these journals, incidentally, are, are retro-digitized and, and freely accessible, which is where I obtained these uh, images. So pure and applied mathematics have been explicitly mentioned for nearly 200 years and were doubtless recognized as being in some way different before that, and our topic is whether they are drifting apart. Each of our panelists will give a, a 10-minute presentation, and then the subject will be open to the floor, and I hope we will have a, a lively discussion. So I ask uh, Leonard Carlison to begin. So mathematics really has three different phases. So, so the first concerns general education, and mathematics is, of course, just as important as learning to read, and this is a very important part of, of, of uh, society. And the second relation to, in relation to, to the uh, outside world is mathematics as the language of science. And this is a co uh, co uh, way in which I'm going to use the word applied mathematics as the language of science. And the third aspect is, of course, uh, 
a subject of its own right, a logical system. And it, this is what most of us who are here right now represent. And we must clearly understand that of the three, we are the weak part. And that it is absolutely vital for the continuation of our science that we love so much to stay with good relations to the other two aspects. So the answer to, to the question if the mathematics and applied mathematics are drifting apart, I would say that we should make every effort that it doesn't happen. And I would like to object somehow to the word drift also. We are not really jellyfish, but, but uh, we can do something about this ourselves. Uh, so I should like to concentrate on the aspect of, of the issue as far as it concerns uh, the teaching of mathematics. Uh, we like to talk about mathematics and applied mathematics in this order, which seems to indicate that uh, applied mathematics is some kind of corollary of, of uh, mathematics and, and that we are looking for ways of applying this. This, is, of course, is completely wrong from the point of view of, of history. On, through the years, mathematics has slowly been being built from nature. And we have observed the remarkable fact that the laws of nature can be coordinated into groups and, and, and they follow rules. Uh, this started with... Uh, geometry, of course, and numbers. And then we all know how difficult it has been to make continuous, uh, that is, movement into something logically reasonable. Uh, and it's been around only for like 200 years in a, in a logical setting. If we take a subject like probability, it's well, it may show that I am old, but anyway, it has been built as a mathematical subject in my lifetime, really. And looking into the future, we can see new areas emerging where the mathematics is, is missing. And the most spectacular there is, is probably computer science. Nevertheless, <coughs> Teaching of mathematics has always been done in a, in a deductive way, that one goes from the general to the special, either as a logical system or as a, applica being applied. And this, is, of course, is contrary to, to the traditional way of how things should be taught. Uh, let me mention to you that this also has happened in my lifetime. When I started studying at the University of Uppsala in 1945, the first lecture was devoted to the Dedekind cut. And uh, we defined continuous functions with epsilons and deltas. And we uh, had axioms and we had definitions and we had Riemann integrability and I don't know what. Uh, as the number of students have increased and their interest in, in the logical structure of the field has decreased, one has successively been cutting off these typically mathematical aspects of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the mathematics teaching. And to put it in, in a striking way, I would like to say that it's only applied mathematics that remains. <coughs> So, and we have, I guess, all of us experienced how there has been pressure from other fields, I mean, from physics or technical subjects or, or even biology, that they want to teach their own mathematics and, and that we don't teach in a relevant way. And I would like to, to say that I can somehow see their point <clears throat> because we have not really made any real effort to... to uh, 
implement any kind of inductive way of teaching. That is going from examples and cases and applications to, to the concept. And you would think that, that the use of computers would have changed this in a drastic way, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. We are still fumbling for ways of, of using computers in the, in the teaching. So my thesis here today would be to say that we should make a really concentrated effort to make our teaching into an inductive teaching. I mean, one can think of, of different ways of ac accommodating students with different interests. So I have made a short list of, of uh, what one could possibly do uh, to, to change here. One of the essential points is clearly the attitude of, of, our, of ourselves, so to say, and also of our colleagues. Everybody knows that most, well, most, many mathematicians are very disinterested in, in things which are not leading to theorems or, or, or news statements. <coughs> and uh, there is a skepticism among our colleagues in, in other areas that anything useful can come out of, of uh, contact with mathematicians. And uh, it is my real wish that you would all or we would all try to, to uh, remedy this situation. So, so what c could be done is, for example, I have made, I have made three points here. So the first is that um, one should have a closer contact with, with the, uh, uh, between the teaching and the applied areas. Uh, at least in, in Sweden, most departments which are applied have separate buildings and uh, uh, we don't really see them. I mean, the, the pure people stay in one area and the applied people stay in another area. And um, uh, it would be my wish that, that people with applied interest would be involved already in, in the construction of the, and the teaching of the basic courses. And also, one would need to change the uh, curriculum in some suitable way and uh, try to speed up the use of of computers in the, in, the, uh, in the teaching. I mean, most, we should really accept the fact that most students are not really interested in mathematics. I mean, they are interested, well, many are interested in their lives, but some of them are also interested in other areas, and one should, uh, should accept that. And, and we shouldn't try to, to put our values on people who don't really want them. You know, one could compare these people with, with how you learn how to drive. I mean, most people have no idea how the car works and why it works, but you can still use it. And, and it's similar with, with the people who, who learn mathematics. They only want to be able to read books or understand the formulas that that they are taught in the other courses. And I think one shouldn't criticize this, and one should accept that this is a very natural attitude. I mean, after all, mathematics, as we know, it is a rather sophisticated and, and not very applicable field. Uh, also, there should be for example, something like P, uh, partial differential equations, everybody should have uh, heard about that. They are going to, to, to meet it somewhere else. And finally, there is a movement in, in the world around us to, to, make, to make different uh, applied, different sections of, of mathematics. You know, there, are, there are pure mathematics and there is uh, industrial mathematics and there is 
applied mathematics and there is the teaching of mathematics, so, which have different organizations and different meetings and live their own lives. And I think that makes sense because it's so big and uh, they have their special interest. But nevertheless, there should be places where you meet and where these, the people from these different areas come together and, and uh, can exchange experiences. Okay, thank you. So, Ronald Kaufman. try to address some of the issues of drifting apart. Uh, you know, the math mathematics is a big ecological system of different species of mathematicians, and each species likes to think of itself as better than the others. The, the issue, though, is that the world of mathematics has expanded dramatically. Our universe is so much bigger that every, everybody is drifting apart from everybody else, but in reality, we enrich our life substantially. Uh, what we have seen, I would say, over the last two decades is the insertion of the computer into our lives, or the digital age. Now, that, that insertion is occurring at a variety of levels. I mean, uh, on the sort of everyday ability to collect numbers, and collect data to the ability for the mathematician to actually run experiments in mathematics. And I would say that if Gauss were here, he would probably run experiments like crazy, Leibniz too, and everybody of those. And they will, if you ask them the question, are they pure or applied, they will just laugh at you. Uh, <laughs> In a way, the drift that we, we seem to see is mostly social uh, and not necessarily intellectual. I mean, we've seen in this Congress that many, many people uh, and many of the talks are related to outside scientific fields or are inspired by outside scientific fields and so on. Uh, the way I see it now is that, in fact, the need for mathematicians, pure mathematicians, not necessarily in the areas of applications, is actually much greater than it ever was. This is sort of a pre-Newtonian time, in a way, and we don't have the mathematics to do the simplest of all things. Uh, we don't have descriptive language to describe various things, and uh, we, we don't even have the ability to define the geometries that need to be defined in the, in the real world. So I think there is a serious opportunity here for mathematician. I mean, that opportunity to realize it, we need to follow what Leonard just said, uh, sort of revamp our teaching style, I would say. Not that I'm saying, I'm not advocating changing what we teach, I'm just, just the way that we do it, in a way that uh, makes it more transparent for people who don't necessarily want to invest the same effort as somebody who was born with mathematics in his blood. Uh, the opportunity is really that it's, it's the same that occurred in the sort of physical scientific revolution at the time of Newton and Leibniz, uh, which is that there is a need to quantitate and describe specifically and precisely all kinds of phenomena that surround us. And the number of phenomena is, is and their complexity is really growing exponentially just because we can. And so digital data is generated uh, in overwhelming quantities uh, all over the place, whether this is web data, document data, sensor data, and we're stuck. So, so let's, let me give you an example. I mean, you, the data may be you have the results of some medical tests, or blood tests, or, or some number that you get, 
and you want to evaluate the function, which is how healthy you are, what health score you can have. We are dealing with a very simple object which depends on 10, 10 20 parameters, and we don't have the tools to approximate them. We, we heard Ron DeVore today telling us something about, about, about some potential tools, but this is the most elementary object of mathematics, which is a function, <coughs> except, unfortunately, the function depends on many more parameters than that we used to do before computers. The number of parameters may be 10, 20. In reality, you may have 10,000 or 10 millions of them, and the tools are not there. So what is needed in this context is for somebody to think very deeply and come up with potential solutions. So mathematicians, pure mathematicians, and their, their modes of thought are necessary. Computer scientists are not trained for the job. I mean, I know of a multitude of examples like that uh, having to do with acoustic calculation, electromagnetic calculation. Unless you completely revamp the mathematics and reorganize everything you need to do, uh, rebuild the language for describing the objects, uh, you can't go anywhere. So it doesn't do us any good to just throw a big matrix at some problem and say this is a linear problem, we can invert the matrix or do this, so that doesn't do anything. So the obstacles confronting us are actually much more monumental than they ever were, and they require the ability to build the language uh, to organize very complex objects, to organize them in, in a variety of geometries. So I just described a minute ago, say, the acoustic in this whole room, that's a problem that, say, 20 years ago, nobody could calculate. And even now, I, I doubt that there's more than maybe 10 people in the world who can actually calculate anything. Because the object, which is, you hear the echoes and everything, and the acoustic here, is so complex that unless you build a language, you cannot use formulas because formulas will not deal with that. But unless you build a new language to describe it, uh, you're dead. So that's one opportunity. Similarly, by the way, if you go to the social sciences or to, say, just documents or machine learning or other fields of that sort, the language and the geometry to describe the objects that you want to manipulate and their internal relations between them, all of that is yet to be invented. I mean, we need people of the kind we had at the beginning. So a few of them we had last century, like Shannon von Neumann, uh, Benoit Malbrot, who is here, who recognized certain geometries that people consistently ignored. All of those are opportunities for mathematics, and that mathematics is pure, although the opportunities and the challenges are coming from the outside world. But in the past, it has always been that the outside world was probably the most inspirational in actually pushing us towards discovering structures. Uh, it's very nice to be sort of uh, motivated by sort of internal uh, ideas, but I mean, I don't think one should be that arrogant in thinking that we know everything that needs to be done. I mean, we should let the world tell us and as I said, invention is really what's needed, and that's the crafting of tools. And the people who craft the mathematical tools are people who are interested by the tool, and the application is a test, if you wish, that the tool is effective. But the people who build tools are mathematicians. You call them, I mean, they may be working like Shannon as an engineer, but he built mathematics, and it was, it is pure mathematics, no matter what, which, no matter what, we say, in fact, it's being used consistently everywhere in pure mathematics. Is probability an applied field? Of course not. It is motivated by application. So I think, basically, uh, we see in, by various communities, like say the machine learning community, the bioinformatic community, the computer science community, we see emerging a variety of sort of methods which are mysterious somewhat ad hoc, but extraordinarily successful. 
And the question really is, what are the underlying structures that enable us to assert that certain methods will work or will not work and what they are capable of achieving? And what are the, the real uh, deep structures underlying it? This is a job of a pure mathematician. Thank you. I am certainly a pure mathematician, and what I would like to discuss here is uh, the implicit presupposition that lies, lies in the base of our distinction between, math between pure and applied mathematics, namely that mathematics can tell us something about the external world, uh, that mathematics can be a cognitive tool although it doesn't look like a cognitive tool. It doesn't study anything specific uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the surrounding world. So uh, in order to understand how mathematics is applied to the understanding of real world, um, it will be convenient for me to subdivide it into the following three modes of functioning, uh, model, theory, and metaphor. A mathematical model describes a certain range of phenomena, qualitatively or quantitatively, but uh, feels uneasy pretending to be something more. Uh, probably one of the uh, most successful early models is uh, Ptolemy's model of epicycles describing planetary motions about 150 years uh, uh, of our era. And one of the latest models which does call itself model is a standard model describing interaction of elementary particles that's around 150, 60, uh, 190, uh, 100, sorry, 1,960. And generally, uh, quantitative models cling to the observable reality by adjusting numerical values of sometimes dozens of free parameters, at least 20 in the standard model. And such models can be remarkably precise. And there are, of course, uh, uh, qualitative models offering insights into stability, instability, attractors, critical phenomena. Uh, as an example, I quote a recent report which is dedicated to predicting a search of homicides in Los Angeles. As a methodology, uh, is, uh, it uses pattern recognition of unfrequent events. Result. We have found that the upward turn of the homicide rate is preceded within 11 months by a specific pattern of the crime statistics. Both burglaries and assaults simultaneously escalate, while robberies and homicides decline. Both changes, the escalation and the decline, are not monotonic, but rather occur sporadically, each lasting some two, six months. Now, the age of computers has seen a proliferation of models which are now produced on an industrial scale, sold numerically, and very often used as black boxes with hidden computerized input procedures and oracular outputs prescribing behavior of human users, for example, in financial transactions. What distinguishes a mathematically formulated theory from a model it's, is primarily its higher aspirations. A theory is, so to speak, an aristocratic model, or if you wish, a model is a democratic theory. 
A modern physical theory, and also old physical theories, generally propose that it would describe the world with absolute precision if only it, the world, consisted of some restricted variety of stuff. Massive point particles are being only the law of gravity and things like that. The recurring driving force generating theories is a concept of reality beyond and above the material world, reality which may be grasped only by mathematical tools from Plato solids to Galileo's language of nature to, to quantum superstrings. A mathematical metaphor, when it aspires to be a cognitive tool, postulates that some complex range of phenomena may, might be compared to a mathematical construction. Uh, probably the most known mathematical metaphor now is the artificial intelligence. Uh, we know very complex systems which are processing information because we have constructed them and we are trying to compare them with human brain which we do not understand very well or do not understand almost at all. So at the moment it is a very interesting mathematical metaphor and what it allows us to do mostly is to uh, sort of cut out our wrong assumptions. If we start comparing them with some very well-known reality, it turns out that they would not work. Uh, my feeling is that mathematical metaphors, oh, more often than not, some models and theories also are used as mathematical metaphors and that as such they then contribute to changing our value system or at least influence our value systems. And I am a little bit concerned about the uh, proliferation of both mathematical models which are hidden inside uh, computers, hardware and software. And also I am concerned about the moral issues that are not often addressed to in uh, discussing duplications and in uh, discussing the utility of mathematics in, uh, for society. Just to very briefly show you what I am concerned about, I will quote a recent sentence, two sentences actually, from a recent book, Mathematics and War. I think the sentences were written with bitter irony. Mathematics can also be an indispensable tool. Thus, when the effect of fragmentation bombs on human bodies was to be tested, but humanitarian concerns prohibited testing on pigs, mathematical simulation was put into play. Thank you. Helmut Mozart. Now you get a little bit of a contrast program. After a meta-theory of applied mathematics, uh, we go back down to earth. Maybe that is the difference between a pure and a applied mathematician. And you see it now live. Uh, but I must say we are not drifting apart with respect to his last sentence. I totally agree with him. Uh, but from the point of view, I would like to change a little bit our point of view now. When I have spoken with people, are pure and applied mathematics drifting apart? Some said, oh, this is this old question. I mean, we had this. Some say yes, some say no. I believe it is really 
the question of a department. If the people, the pure and applied like each other, then it's fine. If they don't, you have a drifting apart. Uh, but I would, I would really like to change. We always do as if mathematics would be the mathematics we do. We, academic mathematician, are the world of mathematics. Are we really? There is a second world, in my opinion. There's a second world of mathematics. Now let's try. Is this working now? Ah, yes, there it is. There's a second word, world of mathematics, and in this second world of mathematics, almost all our graduates live. Those people we educate, they are not, in general, entering our world of academic mathematics. They go somewhere else. And they go into industry, they go in, in banks, in insurances, they go in R&D departments. There is a second world of mathematics outside of our world, outside of academia in industry. And this is what I would call mathematics as a technology. And we should all be very happy that mathematics has become a technology that's, as Ronald Kaufmann has already described, it is really for us also, even if when we are pure mathematicians, it helps us a lot. I will come to this point. So this, this mathematics as a technology, this second world of mathematics, is it pure or is it applied? Now let me describe you a little bit uh, the results of a, of a project. I had together with a psychologist and a historian. It's nice for a mathematician to work with other people. And uh, it was a Volkswagen Foundation project. And uh, we were trying to find out what happened to all the graduates in Germany in mathematics in 1998. So this is eight years ago. Uh, and you know these psychologists are unbelievable. They have really asking questionnaires, these people, unbelievable questions. I would have never dared to ask, are you planning to get children and how is the relation between your profession and your family and so on. But she did and the people answered. And the people answered. Uh, and the question is, what what have they done in the next eight years? I mean, what happened to them? Did their dreams, wishes come true or not? You must understand we had uh, 3,000 graduates in Germany in 1998. That's quite a lot, I think. I think the number today is even higher. Uh, mathematics is very attractive in Germany. You may ask why. Uh, and of these uh, 3,000, 1,400 went into high schools. So they normally become high school teachers. And the other ones, 1,600 made a diploma or nowadays a master. Uh, and we asked these people and 600 of these 1,600 were willing to answer a questionnaire. This is a very good sample. I mean, be aware that 600 of 1600 altogether is, is a rather good uh, sample. And we asked these people again in the following years, 2001, 2003, and 2006. And now, what, what, what happened? What came out? First of all, of this, six, of this 1,600, if you take this as a sample, only 10% became academic people. I mean, they entered universities or research centers. So we speak always about this 10%, and we forget the other ones. 80%, I mean, 10% disappeared somehow. 80% work as software designers in R&D, in, in banks, in insurances, in consulting, and so on. Do they do mathematics? Yeah, they don't do much 
pure mathematics, I must say. I have asked uh, 20 PhD students, former PhD students of mine who work now in, in industry, and they were laughing and saying, do you really, are you kidding if you ask us, uh, do we do pure mathematics or applied? Of course we do, not metaphors, but models and, and algorithms, if we do mathematics at all. Not all of them do real mathematics. So if I saw it correctly from the thing, 25% of all our graduates are doing mathematics in industry. The rest has changed. They do management. They, they don't do, they do something which is not really mathematics. But 25%, now compare 25 to the 10% which go in academia. I claim that the second world of mathematics is a little bit larger than the first world, and we should keep that in mind. There was a citation of the German Mathematical Society news of a, a mathematician who works at IBM. He said that mathematics, we should not overdo, overestimate the value of mathematics in industry. It is the midwife, but not the mother of innovation. But maybe uh, it's good to be a midwife, uh, a very active midwife, which gives so many births to so many good innovations. So you see what is uh, the, the result in the second world. At least as many people do mathematics as in the first world. But of course they do mainly applied mathematics. Now, are these people drifting apart from pure mathematics? What would you say? I mean, <laughs> there is this world, second world, and the first world of pure mathematics. I don't think that they know whether they are drifting apart. They don't see each other. It's so far away. How many of this second world are at this conference here? If I am very optimistic, I would say 10 of 4,000. So you see, there is a real big difference between this applied mathematics in industry and the pure mathematics happening here. And this, of course, is very, very bad. I think this is a damage for both worlds. It's a damage for the second world for the world of mathematics and industry. Of course, there were some arguments already we heard by, by Koifman and others. Of course, we need more mathematics to make it better. It is not at all good. In, in, in medicine, for example, we are totally missing uh, good models which really describe uh, the complex system of a body. So we would urgently need good mathem mathematics which deals really with their problems. But are mathematicians really dealing with their problems? Yes, if they fit in their own way. If not, I am doubting. And for the first world, of course, for our academic world, uh, mathematics as a technology offers a lot. I think it offers uh, a good uh, new challenges, that was also already said. Many, many uh, good problems come from this outer world. They add certainly public prestige. They, this second world adds money if we have contacts with them, and it attracts students. And that's not such a minor thing. So I think really that both worlds need each other very urgently, need each other, but we have to do something. We in the first world have to have open minds. We have to go into industry and see their problems, to speak with them, to get in contact with them, that they know that we care about them and vice versa. They would be interested in what we are doing. Thank you very much. Finally, Peter Sarnak.
Okay, uh, I speak as a pure mathematician. I have a very keen interest in mathematics broadly, so I, I try to follow most mathematical topics, and I've tried applied maths too. It's much more difficult, I find, though my main credit there is I'm an actual double major math and applied math. And, uh, had a difficult choice choosing between pure and applied math. My views uh, are going to be, I think, a little extreme from the pure math side, but I think that's a good proportion of the people in the audience here, so maybe I'll try, try that angle. And also, as Helmut says, I think one's views are highly influenced by one's local interactions daily. So what happens in your department and the discussions you have with your colleagues impact you, and you will see my views are impacted by my colleagues. All right, does this work? So I'm supposed to get out of the way, or what? Ah, thank you. That's applied math, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll just maybe read. So firstly, um, are they drifting apart? Well, certainly we have to take into account this inflationary process of everything drifting apart, but even given that, it is my feeling that they are drifting apart, and I've been in mathematics for 30 years, and my own, over this very short period, my own experience is that it's not exactly what it used to be 30 years ago, and, and I think one of the big impacts is the computer changing our views on many things. Is it a problem? I think it is a problem, but not one that's that serious. I think that these kind of matters should evolve naturally with good science surviving and not such good science going away. And I think that's what will happen here too. However, there are alarms and we've heard a few uh, suggestions, all which, which sound very good. Uh, I will mention some uh, alarms sounded by some of my younger colleagues who I think we should definitely listen to. Anyway, I'm going to take a very maybe controversial way of dealing with this question of whether they're doing, uh, drifting apart by trying to see what is good math, what's good applied math, is there anything in common, in fact, between these two activities. All right, to give a, a formal definition of what pure math is uh, would be very dangerous here. I'm sure that I wouldn't get out of the hall by the end. If, but I think there's one thing that most pure mathematicians, I'm talking here about pure math, mathematicians, we all sort of recognize it when we see it, like a fox when it sees a rabbit. You can see something that's really good, exciting, and cuts to the bottom of the problem. I think the key ingredients, and uh, does this, this one here, should I only use one? Can I use both? Okay. And there's a light somewhere. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> so the key sort of cycle and ingredients in our in mathematics are firstly insights, mathematical insights often become conjectures, uh, theories, language. These are crucial. But to me, the holy grail of mathematics and something we can never give up is that of proof. To me, once there's no proof, I'm not sure it's mathematics. At least that's my, my take on the difference between mathematics and any other science. And given the exciting week we have here, let me give uh, Thurston's geometrization conjecture as the epitome of this sort of conjecture. It's a conjecture which, when put forward, immediately clarified what one is looking for. As all great conjectures, they, if they're true, they're great. Of course, if, if it turned out to be false, it would be much less interesting. But since it appears to have turned out to be true, it's a unifying conjecture. It clarifies the shapes of three-dimensional topological spaces. There's nothing, and it's not something that was obvious, and it was something that was built up with many examples and theories that he developed in order to come to that conjecture. So conjecturing is, of course, a major part in, in our subject. But Thurston, thinking about this, I can't really, I haven't spoken to him recently, but I think you could say this was internally driven rather than by applications. And it's damn good, even though it's driven internally. Many 
fields have such powerful conjectures that unify the theories, and I'm not talking just about these great conjectures, and I'm not talking about only mathematics that's sort of unique and comes once in a very, very, in a blue moon, let's say. So there's that part of the cycle, which is conjecture, and then, of course, as I said before, and I'll repeat, without proof, I'd say, <laughs> without proof, uh, it's not our subject. So we really need that part, and uh, as is, seems clear now, Perelman has proved this conjecture, and sort of this is as good as it gets. There have been other successes of this magnitude, as I said. We can't judge all of mathematics by such great success, but this is what we strive for, and I think many people, young people, very strong people who go into math, it's, it's with this sort of aim in mind. Of course, we all get disappointed and a few su succeed. But I do believe these driving central conjectures are, are, are what drives the subject. So we have the cycle of conjecture, theories built around the conjecture, solution, and then good solutions, good problems always develop further conjectures and further theories. And this cycle seems to just go around and it looks, uh, for someone from the outside, might look like a recipe for a disaster. This is completely internally driven. It looks like it's a st recipe for sterile, a sterile subject. In fact, even within pure mathematics, subjects that are introspective, that interact with no other subject, that are just three experts in the world talk to each other and then they submit their paper to the annals and you get the second expert's opinion and of course it's these, this is the best thing ever written, but you can't get a third opinion, that's a problem. And such subjects naturally shrink, and I think the evolution is, is, is uh, the best way to let these things run. However, I don't believe that mathematics is purely internally driven. And I strongly believe that we are... So I want to argue that pure math needs other sciences, this is my point, as badly as they need us. Now, everybody here will tell you that we need to develop more theories for more applications, and there are beautiful applications here, there, and there. These are very important to make mathematics as active as it is. But we are living in a golden era of pure mathematics, I believe, because of the successes we've seen in recent years. And it is not the case that this could have been internal. If there are in initial conditions, are we at this stage only because of the giants we have around? I don't think so. I think that we are impacted from the outside. And let me continue this with this Perelman example a little to repeat what Hamilton said in his talk here last week. So Perelman's work depends heavily on Hamilton's work, which in turn is based on Ricci flow. And as Hamilton explained, his Ricci flow was motivated to him by Einstein's equations. In fact, the process, the very process Einstein went through in writing down his gravitational equations in equating the only invariant tenses that are around. So when he was forming his Ricci equation 25 years ago, and at that point he had to, everything was very experimental, he relied on this uh, thing that he knew about Einstein's equations. This gave him a lot of confidence that he's on the right track. So this is a very indirect, you might say, means of saying physics impacting this particular program, which on the face of it seems very internal, but it does give you the confidence that you're in the right direction. And I could give you many, many examples of similar things where the our input comes from often from physics, but much from computer science. Of course, the more complex the applied maths, the more engineering, the impact is a little harder to see. But we do live in a world where we impact each other, and I don't believe we are closed cycle and we do need applied math. Just on a social, sociological level, let me tell you a story that I always find. If someone comes into my office and I want to decide whether I, I interact a lot with, let's say, mathematical physicists, and I want to decide whether somebody who's coming to my office is a mathematician or a physicist. And this tells the difference between these two cultures and one that I think shows our weakness and a bit of their weakness. A mathematician will always come into your office and tell you how complicated what he's doing. My proof is a thousand pages long. It's kind of a strange discipline where 
you have to convince someone that you have to write a thousand pages. Probably it means you don't really understand what you're doing. The physicist comes into your office and he's always trying to tell you how simple what he's doing is, and he's always lying because he's hiding 50, 60, maybe 100 pages of calculation. Yeah, that's just a trivial, straightforward calculation. This difference of culture is one that I think explains uh, the difference between math and sort of theoretical physics. The idea that something is, to be good, it has to be complicated, is something that's evolved in certain quarters of mathematics, and I, it seems strange to me and unfortunate. In the end, we are always looking for the simple thing, and the real truth is somewhere in between. That's a sociological thing. Let me turn to good applied math, about which I can really, I have very little right to talk, so I, I asked a few people. But let me first take a complete extreme view that you will find. I'd always remembered this article by its title. Of course, he made that title. This is an article by Helmos called Applied Mathematics is Bad Mathematics. Uh, I didn't bother to read it until I was asked to be on this panel. Then I thought, I wonder what he's got to say. So I went and read it, and he's very entertaining. He's a good writer, but I think he's entirely misguided. And there are many bad points in the article. Even if it is entertaining, there's some interesting points, as I say. But I think the one bad point is very relevant to what I'm saying. He argues that uh, mathematics can exist without applications. I talk applications generally, not just necessarily applied math, but all other sciences. And he says, of course, mathematics can exist and will exist without it. But the converse, uh, he would argue, uh, is, is false. And I. I I don't agree with him at all. I think mathematics cannot exist without the applications. Even the most pure of math would not be where it is today if it weren't for the applications. Now, of course, if you look far enough back, everything is, I mean, if you talk about Leibniz or Newton, they are philosophers, mathematicians, applied mathematicians simultaneously. But today, with everything requiring people to be very specialized, it's much harder to be universal. But even so, I strongly believe that the impact of applied math or applications is crucial to the development of math. Now, I asked a colleague of mine, Wayne Anir, a young, a young uh, he's quite opinionated applied mathematician, which, whose opinion I value, as to what, just to give me a definition of what's good applied mathematics, and he responded as follows. It has to be relevant to application areas, whether the application area is in science, engineering, technology, or industry. That's one thing he he demands. The second thing, and this I found interesting, it has to help putting the relevant application area on a solid sound scientific foundation. This typically requires laying out the mathematical foundation. So uh, he's emphasizing this foundational aspect that a mathematician is supposed to do in another science. And then he added, and this worries me, Personally, I'm very worried that mathematics and applied mathematics are gradually drifting apart, and he says this is particularly a worry in the areas in which he works. He works in computational PDE, scientific computation. So let me end here by saying there's obviously a common ground. It was always the common ground for mathematics and anything else, and that is what really, what we always feel is the crucial thing on you breakthrough ideas in applied or pure math, and when I was young, I felt there was absolutely no difference. However, I'm beginning to feel, maybe I'm just getting old, uh, that it's not really, the, these, there are differences. So that, as I said, in pure math, I can't imagine pure mathematics without proof. Not that, I can't imagine without proof, but where proof is not important. Where people say, well, I don't even care about a proof. That would bother me. Um, in applied math, it's clearly the big issues are insight and explanation of some phenomenon. So it is not clear to me that if proof is valued, or if indeed this has been so far in the past, that it will be, it, that it is valued in applications. I often go to a lecture and the person ends by saying, well, I don't, especially if it's someone who's got a code or something, my code works. Why do I need a proof that it works? Well, it's a little hard to work, argue with something that works, that it requires a proof, although presumably in an ideal world, 
the proof will give further insight or an insight will lead to a proof. And that was always the kind of ideal world that I thought 25 years ago was what it was all about. But I think this drifting apart is occurring and I think you see this with the scientists involved and I'm just an observer. <coughs> so let me end by just saying, while I think the goals and the requirements of pure and applied math are diverging in taking into account inflation, I think that myself that evolution will take care of things. But I'm quite concerned by the comments of Wayne and Air and the comments of my panelists who seem to be also quite concerned, well, maybe not all of them, but some of them. So uh, I am concerned, yeah, thank you. So thank you for these interesting presentations, which I hope now can provoke a lively and of course good-natured uh, discussion. So I invite uh, contributions from the floor these can be either comments or questions to the panel. Uh, when you speak, could you please use one of the roving microphones? I hope there are some roving microphones. And uh, say first uh, who you are. John. Can we have a microphone at the front? Yeah, yeah. Starting? Okay, I. Yes. My name is uh, John Newberger. My qualifications on the subject are half a century in uh, teaching and uh, research and, and consulting. Uh, I'd say yes, uh, the pure and applied mathematics are drifting apart. It's unfortunate. And I'll have a practical suggestion for beginning to pull it back, not a cataclysmic one. Working mathematicians are badly needed in industry and uh, government. I'll say industry to cover uh, a, a broad spectrum. Uh, but there's uh, a great deal of, to be gained by working mathematicians to begin to connect with industry. Uh, they can find out the, they, they need to know what students are faced with intimately. They need to know. This, is, this has been touched on, but they, that would influence their teaching if they, if they know. If, they, if it's just some theoretical thing about what people do in industry, it's hard to make an informed uh, decision. Uh, now, most mathematical questions in industry are phrased in terms of computing. And it's, if someone's going to be of much influence, they need to, they need to understand uh, about computing, some. Now, generally, computing to get started is, is quite easy. We're talking about several weeks to begin to gain some competence in, uh, in computing. It's not that hard. Several weeks is nothing on a pure mathematical, on a pure mathematical question. Now, the fruitful consulting arrangements are not so easy to come by, and I'm suspicious of a bureaucratic solution to try to pair mathematicians in particular to industry, but that's, that's, that's a possibility. But each concerned individual can begin to take some steps uh, with, and with, over the medium term to be able to uh, make some connections of their own to, uh, uh, to industry. And I think that would help modify the courses uh, somewhat and, and begin to draw the two, uh, the two together. Really hard frontier scientific problems demand the uh, abilities of pure mathematicians, in, in, uh, in, in, in my view. And they, be, they become applied once they uh, get, get involved in this. And thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Bijan Zangere, and I am working in stochastic evolution equation. I think the name of pure and applied is uh, depend to the tradition of the country. For example, in North America, my field is pure mathematics. And probability and uh, partial differential equation and nonlinear analysis is part of the pure mathematics. But in French school, probability 
and uh, partial differential equation considered as uh, applied mathematics, mathematic applique. Then uh, I think uh, there are different kind of the applied mathematics and industrial mathematics. You can consider this as a, a spectrum of be pure, only pure, which hardy and maybe almost, you know, called pure mathematics, or you can have something which applied doesn't have a proof or something else. Then I think uh, this is a spectrum, you be pure or, math or applied, which you stand where you stand, and in the left part you is pure, more pure than you, and in the right of you is more applied. Thank you very much. That's in us. Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, what do you think? Okay, do you hear me? Uh, what do you think about the need to invent new mathematics to deal with self-reference or self-organization, uh, the way you, you meet uh, uh, in systems biology, for instance? Or to put it otherwise, uh, what, what do you see if you look uh, at, at available mathematics nowadays to deal with the input-output black box metaphor or the snake eating its own tail metaphor? Is this working? Yeah. It's a terrific question. Uh, I, in terms of uh, dealing with the kind of mathematics that you need to deal with, say, biology or social science or the more complex structures where every piece of information you measure is sort of linked to the others, I think what seems to be emerging is something somewhat what emerged in physics a long time ago where Einstein decided that physics is geometry and that you can describe the physical equations as basically the geometry of space-time. And later on in Young Mills uh, and gauge field theories, somehow the physicists got to the point that the geometry c encapsulates the relationship between all objects around it. I think we see this emerging in, in, uh, in uh, the analysis of, of actually data of various kinds, whether it's a data uh, on the web where you actually can uh, do a fast search by relating every unit of the web to each other and doing some sort of global geometry of the web in order to get a Google rank or some others. This, it's, it's, it's a subtle and, and profound idea possibly. Uh, we, we see it happen in, in biology and neurology and everywhere else. It's sort of the, it's a web of relations between objects which encapsulates sort of their, their, ge their internal geometry or their, their content. And, at least that's, that's my view at the moment. I think it's just emerging, though. I just uh, a little thought about this. I, I actually don't feel it so much that, uh, that these uh, sides of mathematics are drifting apart. Maybe that's because I uh, sort of grew up in a branch which was considered applied uh, I never considered it, I, I always considered it basically a pure ma discrete mathematics and graph theory. Uh, I always considered it basically uh, an area of uh, pure mathematics which has uh, good applications. Now, uh, what uh, I would like to point out is that there are really uh, applied mathematics or applications of mathematics is really a very wide range. And this Congress actually, in this Congress, in the program of this Congress, I can find uh, uh, excellent examples. I mean, um, uh, Professor Ito won, pro won, a, won the, the Gauss Prize for work which he did uh, by uh, motivations that I would consider completely purely mathematical motivations, internal motivations, and then it became extremely important in, 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 in very real life uh, uh, activities like uh, option pricing for stocks and so on. Um, the, 
uh, another kind of application is where, where the mathematician looks at some phenomenon and, uh, and, and then begins to think about it, what kind of mathematical phenomena could be, could mimic this, could, could help to understand this. Uh, this is like the Nevanina Prize winner, John Kleinberg, how he was looking at the internet and, and how it relates to the eigenvalues of the, of the corresponding matrix. Or Shannon, by looking at, at uh, channels uh, uh, of uh, communication, came up with the, the, the fundamental ideas of information theory. And then there is a, also applied math, which... Uh, which Professor Neunzer, second word, was talking about, but, but I just came down from here from uh, uh, Martin Grochel's talk, which also described uh, somewhere where you actually have to produce uh, applicable results. Now, I think that uh, to, to ban any of these or to consider any of these as, as, as uh, inferior would be a very serious mistake. I think it's the intellectual content of the work that, that should matter and not, not its, its particular form. I think uh, all three, and there may be other variations of how we relate to the real world, are, 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 are terribly important for us. Uh, now, I also, just one more thought, is that... Uh, the level of mathematics that, peop that, that other scientists need varies very much. And sometimes a simple thing as solving a quadratic equation could be extremely useful. And in other cases, of course, you, you really need uh, very sophisticated and, and, and new mathematics. But uh, I don't feel that drifting apart, really. I think in... in, in in uh, mathematical areas which, which are thriving, there's always a lot of uh, exciting connections with, with mathematics, with, with, with apl applications and with ideas that come from the real world. Yep. So, my name is uh, Bernhard Boos from Roskilde University in Denmark, and uh, I was actually the author of this one sentence uh, which was quoted from the book uh, Mathematics and War uh, by Yuri Manin, and I can confirm you <laughs> that this was meant really as a sarcastic remark and a kind of polemic against the former president of the American Mathematical Society who felt that the time was best for making more funds for National Science Foundation and for mathematics in hearing for Congressional Budget Committee uh, uh, just in the very moment when the efficiency of uh, uh, mathematical technology of uh, uh, Professor Neunzert's second uh, uh, culture of mathematics was transmitted in television around the world with pinpoint accuracy uh, in the Iraq war. And this leads me uh, to the uh, broader question of uh, Moral, because I noticed that Professor Neunzert, for example, answered on your comment just, we should all be happy that mathematics has become technology. It helps everybody. It, it, all innovations are good innovations. And, uh, of course, we need... This is uh, also a new situation, perhaps, for mathematics, that we are confronted in the degree that some of our theories become more applicable, as Professor Neunzer correctly pointed out, that there is this second culture of mathematics developing, that we are also 
We confronted with problems where physicists or medical doctors have a longer tradition of discussing ethical issues than we have in mathematics. And we should perhaps add that one special thing of the ethics of mathematics should be not to overstate the role of mathematics in different connections. One of the disasters, perhaps, of this uh, Iraq uh, war was that there was a general belief, both in the United States and in some European countries, that deep, complicated political problems can be solved like nothing by help of modern mathematics-based technology. And I think if we tried as mathematicians a little bit to be more modest in our own statements about the value and, uh, the, uh, 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 of uh, our mathematical applications, not only about uh, what we really can do and where we are, uh, then we would uh, perhaps uh, 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 prevent uh, that uh, the public is uh, putting too much aspirations in mathematical technology. And I think this is a kind of second moral issue that we should try to keep just to uh, the substance and uh, uh, try to be modest in our statements about possible mathematical applications. I, since you cited me several times, may I try a short answer? Um, when I say mathematical technology, I mean that mathematics has become a technology. It's not so that all technology is mathematics. You turn it around. I mean, it's not so that I think, I don't believe that mathematics is now responsible for all weapons which are in the world. There may be some mathematics used. Can you guarantee with any mathematics you do that it is not used by somebody else for weapons? You can never guarantee that. We can only have the following moral. We use our ability as mathematicians as good as possible with the full responsibility for what, what we can do. So we must have a moral. We, I would not work for weapons, for example. That's, that's my decision. But we cannot say uh, we should stay abroad from, 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 from apl applications of mathematics since there may be some, some, uh, some applications which we would not like. I mean, this is an old discussion in, in, in Germany and everywhere, but I wouldn't guess, I wouldn't say that we can go so far. I am still happy that mathematics has become a technology, and I would nevertheless try to avoid any bad application. That's another story. Who else would like to speak? Thank you very much. This is Bujan Zadev. Uh, my subject is homological and commutative algebra. Uh, as we all know that mathematics was part of science until the Newtonian stage. If we consider uh, still as a part of science, we know that the mission of the science is to recognize the phenomenon of natural society and everything can be considered as phenomenon to predict its behavior and to use, use it for the sake of human beings. If we consider mathematics as a science, I think pure math is a part of applied mathematics. Its root is within the phenomenon. And the diversion, I think, can be said diversion, might be not diversion, is the point that when mentally like to generalize something from very real problem to mental problem, at that point, 
we call that pure mathematics. For instance, if the generalized equation of degree two, which is real, to degree three may be still real, to degree n, such as Fermat equation, x to n plus y to n equals to z to n takes several hundred to be solved, but might be no immediate application. It's pure math, but it's rooted from the phenomenon and from the science itself and uh, applied mathematics. So I don't know why, as the people doing mathematics, especially mathematicians, like to apart mathematics from science. Indeed, it's a sort of science rather than generalizing very, very pure object, pure concept, pure theory. Some of, I think I remember in the notices of AMS, one considered this case as the River Mississippi. In some places, diverse and from the rooted, from the mainstream to somewhere else, which is apart from the mainstream. Some part of mathematics looks like the same. Very generalization, very theoretical. They may not have immediate application. I think in the future, those sort of things would be very, very limited. Either maybe not at the table of any mathematician. Thank you very much. Bottom. The microphone in the front. Hello? No, well. Okay, just take this. Okay. First you and then Martin. Should I speak? Yeah, first for you. Uh, my name is Oleg Viro. I am sort of pure mathematician, I think, and uh, I want to uh, ask uh, um, the uh, people leading the discussion about definitions. I do not understand uh, who are drifting from, from me. Uh, I'm applied mathematician, uh, pure mathematician. So, uh, how do you define uh, applied mathematician? Uh, really, uh, in any science, uh, people do calculations, use formulas. Uh, I think it is impossible to call all this uh, mathematics, applied mathematics. It is impossible, say, to hire anyone of even very successful to math department as a professor of uh, applied mathematics. There should be some definition of this. Say, uh, should those people who are applied mathematicians, uh, who are considered applied mathematicians, know mathematics, have a mathematical education? I'm asking these questions uh, because they are practical and also make sense for this discussion. Thank you. Okay. Maybe I can try. One of the things that Eyre was most concerned about was that people that he defines as doing applied math be educated mathematically in the traditional way. He felt this was really important. Um, that's answer, when, when he said he was very concerned, he in fact added that one of his concerns in this direction of education and students is that uh, somehow the applied math community was not attracting the very best 
mathematically talented people. So I'm, I'm just firstly answering your question in connection with what he told me. I think um, I agree with you. I, who's drifting from who? That's a good question. But I think there is a difference in what an applied mathematician does and what a pure mathematician does. The, as we, we, um, Lovash mentioned Ito, he had a major impact on the world, but he was not motivated in what he was doing by applications. Most pure mathematicians feel they are working on problems purely uh, because of trying to understand number, geometry, the theory of equations more deeply. But the application we all hope will come, and if it wasn't for that, it wouldn't be that important a subject, but we do have a different way of going about things. Applied mathem mathematics, I think, uh, again, quoting Air, has to have applications in mind, and the style is very different. If you pick up a journal in pure mathematics, there's a theorem, there's a proof, or there's an attempt uh, of making a certain kind of discussion. Many applied math or scientific journals, you pick up and uh, they're talking about a phenomenon, and then there's a pictures, and there's a, um, a phenomenology, which is all very interesting science, but we do things very differently. And, it, and I think that where these things surface is in, in your own department. So I, I would like to say that I agree with you, that we're all the same, but I think the way we go about things is very different. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so this, you stumped me on. <laughs> so maybe I can offer a definition. So I'm Martin Grotschel, and uh, I would like to address one uh, issue that has been implicit in all talks. That's psychology, and uh, I would like to add psychology of institutions. Uh, usually, uh, there are camps in different buildings, and Leonard Carlson said, well, the applied mathematicians are in this other building, and that basically contributes to the feeling them and us. And uh, they could be just different people, and all of a sudden he is applied or, or not. And uh, many of us have lived different lives. I've been a pure mathematician for a while, and now I'm very applied, but I value both sides, and I think uh, one of the greatest experiences in my life is I moved to Berlin and they didn't have an institute of applied and of pure mathematics. They were all together. And uh, this is actually something very valuable. And now people, the scientists, the mathematicians, and students float between the various areas, which I find uh, extremely positive for both sides. And uh, that will help to keep these uh, pieces together. And uh, I, I believe that this driving out of certain areas from mathematics into applied mathematics, from applied mathematics into other uh, institutions uh, has been a really bad historical process. I mean, if I look at the U.S. situation, applied mathematics is basically if you deal with differential equations. The optimizers are sitting in industrial engineering, the discrete mathematicians, often in computer science, statisticians sit any, everywhere else but in mathematics. And what, what is the reason for this? During certain periods of time there were power games and uh, that's how they split apart and, and uh, this is a bad evolutionary process and if we can we should try to bring these groups together and I think that would be an important part on the institutional side and that will resolve many of the issues we are discussing here and uh, I don't I cannot offer a definition of pure and applied mathematicians but I, I believe that this kind of uh, space distributions uh, that uh, contributes a lot to this feeling that there are other parts of, of mathematicians and mathematics. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I want to thank the panel for a very thoughtful discussion. Dave Levermore from University of Maryland. Uh, I, I've, I have a hat that is a pure hat and an applied hat, so I can try and speak both sides of the issues. I think Martin raised a very important point, is institutionally what can we do? I think the, 
The issue is not so much we drift apart. I think that criticism is, is valid because we do have control of this. I think the phenomena has to do with the expansion of human knowledge and endeavor. And I think all disciplines, to some measure, are, are confronted with this, in particular universities, but all institutions, not just academic. And I think one model from the states that's grown up in response to this balkanization that you describe actually is one to look forward to because whereas you were talking about tying people who call themselves wear different mathematical hats together, really it's an issue of being aware of the intellectual landscape about us. And that means not only talking to statisticians or computer scientists, but also to engineers and and uh, sci uh, physicists, chemists, biologists. And one model that does exist in the U.S., I think, and is thriving at some institutions is the development of centers. Centers that focus around maybe an application or an idea that brings together people of uh, uh, mathematical paradigm or an engineering paradigm or whatever to work together, learn from each other, stimulate each other. Uh, I think uh, uh, just, for example, the mathematics department at Maryland is tied to a Norbert Wiener Center in applied harmonic analysis, which involves pure mathematicians and, and, uh, and uh, engineers. We have a, a list of several institutes like that. And I think we, if we put our minds to it, we can overcome these sort of intellectual barriers that separate us artificially because ultimately, I think the picture the whole panel has played that this is a human endeavor uh, is really the right one. And uh, I look forward to a, a very good future. Perhaps I could say something about my own experiences of, of uh, applied mathematics. I, uh, I work um, in the calculus variations, but also uh, in its applications to materials. And I, I, I've written papers with electron microscopists. Now, I believe in the value of theorems in, in applied mathematics, and I, I believe in the value of theorems for telling us when computer codes work. Uh, to me, it seems that there's the three elements of modeling, analysis, and computation, and, and, and they all feed on each other to improve uh, what goes on. But, but I, I think it's an interesting process when you start working on, on a, in a new area, a new scientific or some new application area where you, something gets you interested in it and then you, you, uh, you see that there's something mathematical and you learn a bit more about it. And, and at some point you have to have some confidence that you can offer something to this field. At the same time, you've not done a, a degree in the biosciences or materials or, what, or, or whatever subject it is, and so you have to somehow be humble and, 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 and put in a lot of work to learn, to learn at least a little piece of this area so that you can break down uh, uh, these uh, language barriers. And I, I think that's a really exciting process. Uh, but um, to start with, you, you may encounter some resistance from the people in the area. And one piece of advice I have is always to cut out the middleman uh, or woman, uh, talk directly to the person who's doing the experiments. And, and, and try maybe to avoid some of the intervening theory. So who, who else would like to speak? Um, one more in the front. Mm -hmm. I want to make clear what I really asked about. I didn't ask really about definition. I want uh, you to, to say if you really believe that mathematician, that applied mathematician is mathematician, that uh, he or she should have qualification of a mathematician, should, should know basic things, should speak mathematically, should, should know some uh, basic things about this. And th that's it. If, if it is defined, if, if they are defined as uh, people who are publish, publishing papers in uh, journals with uh, applied mathematics in the title. This is one thing. If, if we have something more specific in mind, it's another thing. Well, my answer would definitely be yes, but I think I'd better let some of the other people on the panel give their view on this. 
would you say yes with respect to the question he must have a mathematical qualification to be a mathematician? That's your answer, yes? To a certain extent, not, you know, he needs to know certain basics, absolutely. How many mathematicians in this room do not have a mathematical education? I mean, I know many physicists who have become very good mathematicians later on. Would you not count them? I, if we follow Peter Sarnak here, he would tell you that anybody who can prove theorems qualifies, right? The only issue is what do you mean by proving theorems? And that's... Uh, you know what I mean. I know what you mean, but I think you, you, you did not think about it enough. Uh, an applied mathematician would come up, say, with a computational algorithm. Then the theorem involved in that algorithm is that he can, by a certain s scheme, compute something to some precision. That's a theorem, right? And the, the goal there is not to climb the Everest and prove some old conjectures or do something that will impress your colleagues. The goal is to achieve, to solve the difficult problems, to find the tools to do it. And it really, it's really the intellectual challenge involved which maybe will qualify him as being a good mathematician or a good applied mathematician. I don't think it makes any difference. It's really the, the intellectual novelty and content that will allow you to think of the people as a, as a person, as a mathematician. I think Shannon was an engineer, right? But I mean, there's no way you could say that he wasn't a mathematician. Hi, I'm Bob Cohn from the Current Institute. Uh, I actually find it very reassuring that there's some difficulty in defining, the, separating the applied mathematicians and the pure mathematicians here. And I think that uh, something that nobody took the time to do was to talk about uh, how mathematicians, pure and applied, are really rather different in our mission, in our worldview, and uh, in our in our functioning from, well, the other sciences. I think the most important thing here is not that we worry about creating separations between pure and applied mathematics, mathematicians or uh, defining those two. It's really more about making sure we don't leave a big gap between uh, mathematics on the one hand and other areas of science on the other in the areas I work in, which tend to be mainly close to the physical sciences or finance. Uh, the, the mathematician's job is to think about whether the algorithm really works, to think about what are the properties of this model, to solve problems, to form, to, to look at whether um, opportunities have been missed by not bringing to bear the right set of tools, uh, to develop new tools sometimes if they're called for in the application area. And there's nobody else out there who's going to do that if we don't. Fortunately, I think uh, to a large extent, uh, we're not drifting apart. I sort of disagree with many panel members, and I think that uh, uh, the talks at this meeting are the best possible proof of that. There's a question in the middle, same level. I'm uh, Ari Belenki from uh, Baralan University, Israel. Um, uh, when uh, there is a discussion, and the uh, discussion lasts for many years, I uh, like to, rec um, uh, to think each time about uh, epigraph which uh, uh, Karl Popper uh, put before um, his book on uh, a philosopher of science, uh, Karl Popper, put uh, before his uh, book. It was, uh, it, there were two statements, one by Kant and another by Schlick. Uh, Kant said that if he 
uh, knows about uh, uh, prolonged discussion, he believes that there is a uh, serious issue in the kernel. And um, uh, the leader of uh, Vinia's uh, circle, uh, Schlick, uh, uh, says that when he uh, knows about prolonged discussion, he believes that it is a matter of words or definitions. Um, so uh, several people uh, pointed to the um, bad definition of uh, uh, pure and applied mathematics, and uh, I didn't hear that any of uh, panelists suggested, even attempted to define these words. But I believe that there is a word in uh, uh, the question which was uh, proposed, uh, which uh, uh, could be defined or at least uh, uh, must be attempted um, uh, to define, and it is the word drift. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the second panelists, I think, suggested that uh, uh, the matter is mostly sociological, and I think drift uh, uh, probably could be defined in sociological terms. In fact, uh, one could try to formulate a theorem in a sense or uh, suggest a parameter uh, which could define this drift. Uh, and uh, probably you would agree that uh, drift uh, between two parts of mathematics could be measured somehow. Uh, in sociological terms, I, I uh, was pleased to hear that someone here tried to um, uh, suggest um, uh, military power of a state as a proof that uh, drift between um, pure and applied mathematics uh, is not uh, great. Uh, in, in a sense, uh, if uh, applications are very close to um, uh, kernel, mathematical kernel, this is a, a witness that uh, military stre uh, strength of uh, countries uh, is great. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I would like to hear, say, um, uh, maybe there is another parameters which could uh, define um, uh, drift or any, any other words, at least, in, in the question proposed. But uh, uh, since I'm, uh, in the last time I'm doing a history of mathematics, uh, let me say, uh, also make a remark on style of uh, uh, presentations by panelists. And I think the most uh, interesting in this respect, in respect of style where the fourth and fifth panelists, uh, the one uh, who argued for uh, applied mathematics suggested two, two numbers, 10% uh, uh, who are uh, stayed in academia and 25%, which are, uh, it's interesting definition, the second uh, world of mathematics. And I believe that this would be the only two numbers which would be remembered uh, from this discussion, uh, in fact. Um, so I believe it was a very successful uh, presentation where two numbers and uh, all of us would remember them. While uh, the fifth panelist, instead of uh, statistics, he suggested uh, two quotes and uh, one from a famous mathematician from Halmas uh, and another from his friend. Uh, uh, of course, uh, it's good to uh, remember what Halmas said uh, but uh, ag again, uh, this is like two examples against uh, statistics uh, presented by four penalists. Um, in my view, uh, the uh, four penalists who argued for uh, applied mathematics uh, uh, made his pr uh, presentation much better in, in both, uh, in, from any point of view, even from point of view of actual presentation on the uh, screen. So um, I believe that... Uh, the fourth panelist, in a sense, uh, won the... Uh, okay, I think we're not, we're, we're not rating the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more comments or questions? Yes, one over there, yes. Oh, two, two, actually, yes. I am uh, Hassan Bouzahir from uh, Morocco. I am in an engineering school. I am working on uh, uh, applied mathematics. But uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, we should say mathematics. There is one mathematics, none pure and applied mathematics. And the question is, uh, is mathematics drifting from technology? This is the, the question. And this is the question that should, should be uh, uh, answered by mathematicians. And I think that mathematicians should uh, work on things that 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 uh, 
that are uh, good for, for technology and not uh, only uh, on mathematics. That's my point of view. Thank you. And there's a question over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Alexei Tretyakov. I'm uh, from Russian State, Moscow State University and Russian Academy of Science, but the <clears throat> last year I'm working in Poland. And um, what I <clears throat> would like to um, ask, as a, <clears throat> uh, the famous Russian ma mathematician, uh, Andrei Kolmogorov, uh, at the <clears throat> last years of his uh, life, said that, that uh, he thinks that there must appear a new type a new mathematics, new type of uh, science that for investigation of reality. And now, observing the uh, last achievements, last events in uh, <coughs> mathematics, I see that they uh, have more and more general and global character. And uh, is it mean that maybe we, we are standing before possibility of creation so-called global a calculus, global differential calculus, uh, what it means, uh, uh, I'm trying to explain. Uh, when uh, Leibniz and Newton have created their uh, differential calculus, it uh, has been local, of course, differential calculus, uh, because we are investigating local behavior of uh, function in the neighborhood of one point. But uh, now, based on the achievement of uh, scientific community, we have possibility to create new so-called global differential calculus when we can observe behavior all manifold, all manifold. And based on this theory, we can uh, unify uh, your question pure and apply mathematics. Very powerful, powerful will be unification of this uh, to direction based on this global differential calculus. Maybe uh, what your opinion about this? Maybe Kolmogorov uh, said about this possibility, this new math mathematics. Thank you. I wish I knew the answer. I don't know. I think something will emerge obviously in the next 10, ten years uh, that will allow us to see new interesting mathematical structures, but more than that, I don't know. Question for that? Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre Bourguignon. Um, my specialty is differential geometry and global analysis. Uh, it seems to me that in the dis discussion, we are mixing three different levels, which I think is, uh, makes the discussion a bit confusing. The three levels for me are the following one. The first one is really the science itself. And for me, if you speak about the science itself, I think the terminology mathematics and applied mathematics is not a good one, as was pointed out already by some people. The second level is as professionals. Most of us are really making a living by teaching. So it means from that point of view that uh, the, what happens to our students is something which should be of primary importance to us. And from that point of view, I found the, the remark by Professor Neunstadt very adequate. That is, if so many of our graduates are really working in uh, the world of technology or um, of all sorts of technology, I think we need to know as professionals a little bit what uh, our graduates are doing. And the third level is as scientists, and because the impact of science on society is uh, growing, uh, I mean, bigger and bigger every year, we really have also uh, another role, which is really providing answers to problems which are posed uh, to the society in general, and then we are asked to, um, I mean, inter interfere or interact with, uh, say, other scientists, but also people from working in the world of technology. And it seems to me that depending which level you take, then the drifting has to be measured by different means. Uh, it's certainly true that if you take the first um, area, I think there is no drift because I, I think, and this Congress is a very good proof of that, we have now ample evidence of the fantastic impact of new questions coming from technology to mathematics. If you take the second uh, point of view, 
then the, the growing number of our graduates who are really involved in the working in uh, really in the society and therefore uh, really uh, using the skills we give them uh, in a very applied way, something which forces professionally to get a better knowledge of these applications. And the third level is uh, even another one, which is in which way, and that's probably the one in which uh, the question of uh, ethical dimension of our profession is very important, uh, in which way we can contribute to really this uh, scientific enterprise, which is more and more shaping the world. And shaping the world means good and bad things at the same time. In the back, over there. I've got a microphone over there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this discussion is extremely interesting, but uh, it is not so new. It originated already in Plato, uh, where he was discussing pure and applied mathematics uh, in respect to uh, Archimedes' uh, implication in the defense of Syracuse. But um, already uh, about 40 years ago, uh, Marc Katz, uh, try to define the difference between pure and applied mathematics by saying that uh, pure mathematics try to find a difficult answer to a situation which were rather easy, while applied mathematics was to try to uh, give uh, easy answer to situations who were extremely complicated. Uh, I think it is very hard to make different definitions which uh, will, uh, which will uh, agree with everybody. But the distinction, probably for me, is more between the pure mathematician and the applied mathematician than between pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Uh, the pure mathematician, as has been saying, is somebody who finds his, uh, his, uh, uh, his motivation inside, while the applied mathematician is somebody who should be more willing to find his motivation outside or in a simpler way. The applied mathematician should be the mathematician who should be encouraged to answer questions asked by other scientists, other mathematicians, uh, engineers, in order to try uh, to be useful to society. And maybe what we should do is to encourage all mathematicians to be more receptive to dialogue with uh, other fields and with other people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try for one more, one more question, I think. Is there anybody? It's not, it's not turned on. Well, I, I would like to ask Professor Manin here and to, to the closing of this scene uh, and uh, to recall a saying from Harald Bohr, which I learned from Barry Jessen. He, they had in this discussion with Hardy uh, sometimes a little bit leger uh, distinction for mathematics and mathematic qualities and they distinguished then generally science uh, whether it was in an extensive phase uh, or whether it was in a consolidating phase. And as I recall from what I learned from Bill Jessen, uh, Harald Bohr was always envying and, and admir had big admiration for this phase of consolidation in the physics in the 20s and 30s. After a previous period of extension with many, many new results, uh, in the end of the 19th century. And 
they always claimed that mathematics at their time, that means also in the 50s or in the 40s of last century, still was unfortunately in a phase of extension and that what we needed for mathematics was a new phase of consolidation. And would you agree with Sarnak when he says we had a period of 30 years or something like that, a kind of golden period for pure mathematics, which then in this Bohr term was a phase of truly consolidation where various fields in pure mathematics showed and proved interconnected and said this could be a good starting point for us also to contribute, make real valuable contribution to other fields like biology, which in spite of the great achievements of Watson and Craig 50 years ago, still is, as was also described by other speakers, in this phenomenology. And would you share such an optimism that perhaps the time, the basis of these last 30 years gives us a new impulse really to do something also for contributing a consolidation in these more phenomenological expanding sciences? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, yes, I do agree with Peter Sarnak that the last uh, 30 years were years of great consolidation and uh, maturing sort of of the uh, mathematics of the 20th century. Uh, I'm less sure, I mean emotionally less sure about how to characterize in such admittedly simplistic terms the uh, development that uh, the development that is connected with computers computer science and internets uh, Kolmogorov whose name was mentioned here introduced the notion of uh, Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, Kolmogorov complexity, very roughly speaking, Kolmogorov complexity of a piece of information is the length of the shortest program which can be then used in order to generate this piece of information. In this respect, one can say that classical laws of physics uh, such fantastic laws as, as Newton's law of gravity or Einstein's equations uh, were ex are extremely short programs to generate uh, a lot of descriptions of uh, real physical world situation. I am not at all sure that Kolmogorov's complexity of uh, Data that was data that were uncovered by, say, genetics in the uh, Human Genome Project, uh, or even uh, modern cosmo cosmology data. I am not at all sure that their Kolmogorov complexity is uh, sufficiently small that uh, they can be really grasped by human minds. One should be aware that if a certain uh, large piece of information has a very large Kolmogorov complexity, then we are bound not to understand it. We are bound to relegate the processing of this data to computers or computer nets or whatever. And I uh, have a very strong suspicion that this is a new situation in uh, natural sciences with which we really do not yet know how to cope. We produce technology and it might happen that this technology is absolutely indispensable to deal with this data. And since I believe that 
uh, a good joke is the best end of everything, let me propose you a joke, I do not know whether it's good or bad, of applied mathematics, or rather of some far end of the spectrum of applied mathematics. Okay, and an applied mathematician helps to do well things that should not be done at all. So with that, uh, we have to draw uh, our proceedings to a close. Um, I, I wouldn't dare summarize this discussion, very interesting uh, uh, though it has been. Uh, but can I thank you all uh, for your contributions? There will be a record of this round table in the proceedings. We've yet to decide exactly how to do that. But those of you who have contributed may find yourself getting emails to get our permission to put your words of wisdom in the proceedings. Could I thank, uh, first of all, on your behalf, Marta Sensoli, who organized the uh, round table. and especially our panel. Good evening.